Hello everyone and welcome back to Nuclear Reactor Kinetics and Dynamics Lectures. We have begun our journey into the land of the adjoint flux, which again describes the importance of neutrons relative to the eigenvalue of a system. We can obtain the adjoint flux by solving the adjoint Boltzmann transport equations, and today we will now derive the adjoint loss and production operators, m star and f star, in these equations. Our goal in deriving these terms is to find a function that satisfies the property of adjoints, which will be necessary to derive the first order perturbation equations later. Let's start with the neutron loss operator m star and derive a function that will satisfy the property of adjoints. The neutron loss operator contains three terms, the leakage term, the scatter term, and the total collisional term. Now let's start by deriving m star for the total term. The Boltzmann transport equation describes the neutron balance as a function of space, so r, and energy, e, and direction, omega. So to get this inner product, we will need to multiply m phi by the adjoint flux, which is a function of space, energy, e, and direction, omega, and then integrate over all three of these variables. Now after we perform this integration, our goal is to find an expression for m star that will make the second phi m star phi star inner product equal to the first inner product. So what can go here in this space to make these two expressions equal? Well, if m star equals sigma total, then these two expressions will in fact be equal. The fluxes in sigma t are just multiplied together, so we can use the commutative property of multiplication to rearrange the order of these terms and to place the adjoint flux on the inside of this operation. This means that m star for the total collisional term is actually just equal to m for the total collisional term for the forward Boltzmann transport equation. Great, so now we have derived one term in the adjoint m operator for the Boltzmann transport equation. However, unfortunately, things will get a little more complicated from here. The next term we'll discuss is the leakage term. The inner product of phi star m leakage phi is given here. And once again, we want to swap the order of phi star with phi in this expression. Now, the derivation for this is fairly complicated, and it's discussed in detail in Appendix B of Ott's Nuclear Reactor Dynamics textbook. But long story short, we can rearrange the terms from the inside and the outside of the omega dot del operator by simply adding a negative sign. Thus, the adjoint neutron leakage operator is simply equal to the negative of the forward neutron leakage operator. Conceptually, for the forward Boltzmann transport equation, the leakage operator describes how neutrons will tend to diffuse away from areas of high neutron concentrations and into areas of low neutron concentrations. Because of this added negative sign, the reverse happens here. And the adjoint leakage operator states that a neutron's importance will tend to diffuse away from regions of low importance and to accumulate into regions of high importance. This makes sense because low importance neutrons will tend to be eliminated from the system before too long, whereas neutrons in higher importance regions will have a greater chance of causing fissions and thus continuing the chain reaction. Next we'll derive an expression for the adjoint scattering source term that satisfies the property of adjoints. The inner product of phi star times the scattering source term is equal to the integral over space, energy e, and direction omega of phi star, which is a function of r, e, and omega, times the integral over e prime and omega prime of the double differential scattering cross-section times phi as a function of r, e prime, and omega prime. Now to get an adjoint form of this expression, we need to find some form of mathematical manipulation that will swap phi star and phi, which alarmingly don't even use the same variables in expression. One of them uses e and omega prime, whereas one of them just uses e and omega. To perform this kind of switcheroo, we will need to do two things. First, we will swap the e and e prime variables and the omega and omega prime variables. We end up integrating out these variables anyway, so it's okay to swap them so long as we still integrate over each variable eventually. Second, we will reorder the integration in these expressions to move phi to the outside and then phi star to the inside of the expression. Swapping e and e prime 
and omega with omega prime gives us this expression. And now we can swap the order of the e and e prime integrals and then the omega and omega prime integrals. Because phi star now only depends on e prime and omega prime, moving these integrals into the inside of this expression will move phi star with it into the inside of the inner product. Likewise, phi goes along with the e and omega integrals as they are moved to the outside of this expression. Notice that the double differential scattering cross-section must stay in the innermost integral throughout this process because it depends on both e, e prime, and omega, and omega prime. Performing these two steps leaves us with an inner product that has phi on the outside and phi star on the inside, and thus we have obtained an expression for the adjoint scattering source operator. Please note that there should be negative signs in these two m phi and m star phi star equations. Now this operator looks eerily similar to the forward scattering source operator, but notice that the e and e prime and omega and omega prime terms have been swapped in the double differential scattering cross-section. Essentially, the scattering matrix has been transposed between these two functions. So what does this mean? Previously, our scattering source represented the number of neutrons that scattered into this phase space from all other energies and directions. Now, the opposite is true. When a neutron enters a scattering collision, the importance is equal to the importance generated by the emerging particle's energy and direction. This makes sense, as the importance of a scatter seems like it should depend on what the neutron does after the scattering collision happens. For example, a scatter with uranium-238 is mostly irrelevant in systems because it doesn't significantly change a neutron's energy, whereas a scatter with hydrogen is very important because it gives the neutron a significant chance to thermalize. Our last term to contend with is the neutron production operator, or the fission operator. To determine the adjoint fission operator, we'll follow the same steps that we did before for determining the adjoint neutron scattering source term. We will first change variables to swap E with E prime and omega with omega prime. Next, we will swap the order of integration to bring the phi star term into the inside of the expression and the phi term to the outside of the expression. Notice in this expression that the first integrals depend only on e and omega, whereas the bottom integrals depend only on e prime and omega prime. Because there are no overlapping variables, like the double differential scattering cross-section contained, switching the order of integration is much easier here than for the scattering source term. And thus, we have developed an expression for the adjoint fission operator. This adjoint operator has kind of turned physics on its head for our system. Instead of having fission neutrons that are born at the chi spectrum energies and that create fission neutrons according to the new sigma fission cross section, our adjoint neutrons are born at energies dictated by new sigma fission and they generate fission neutrons according to the chi spectrum cross section, where cross section is in quotation marks. So having done all this, we now have an expression for m star, the adjoint neutron loss operator, and f star, the adjoint neutron production operator. The very last term for us to discuss is the adjoint eigenvalue, lambda star. Now the adjoint eigenvalue is actually identical to the forward eigenvalue. In fact, proving that these two are equal will actually be a question on one of your homework assignments. So now we have all the terms in our adjoint Boltzmann transport equations, and we can use these equations to solve for the adjoint flux. Now in practice, how do we actually solve for the adjoint flux? The answer might surprise you, but we actually solve for it exactly the same way that we solve for the forward flux. We could apply a SN radiation transport code, or even a Monte Carlo code to solve these equations. Now the way that most people do this is essentially to trick the code into thinking that it's solving the forward Boltzmann transport equation, and it's actually solving the adjoint Boltzmann equation. For example, 
The multi-group tsunami code developed at Oak Ridge National Laboratory solves the adjoint transport equation by simply doing a forward simulation with the rearranged nuclear data. Remember that our adjoint and forward operators are pretty similar, so with a little bit of nuclear data trickery, we can trick the code into solving the adjoint transport equation even though it still thinks it's solving the forward equation. More specifically, what Tsunami does is it transposes the double differential scattering matrix that it gives to the Monte Carlo code, it replaces the chi neutron spectrum with a nu sigma fission neutron source spectrum, and then it replaces the nu sigma fission fission production cross-section with the chi function. The code thinks it's solving a forward transport problem, but it's actually solving the adjoint transport equation. This concludes our journey into the adjoint Boltzmann transport equation. Next time we will use these new adjoint concepts in fascinating ways and derive the first order perturbation equation.